Good afternoon, everyone. I am Tony Robinson with MAP, and welcome to today's webinar titled Why Cooling is Vital in Medical Injection Molding and How to Perfect It, presented by Corey Hepner of RJG. Just a few notes before we get started. We will be keeping all attendees muted throughout the presentation. We are recording the webinar, and it will be up on our webinar archives page in the next few days. You will need a member login to access that page, so just reach out to us if you need any help with that. There is time for questions at the end of the presentation. Please use the question or chat features on the GoToWebinar pop-up to ask any questions. And if you have any logistical issues, you can use those same features, and I will help you troubleshoot. With all of that being said, I will turn it over to Corey. Hello, everyone. My name is Corey Hepner. I'm a consultant trainer specialist two at RJG. It's my pleasure to speak in this event and to share why cooling is vital in medical injection molding and how to perfect it with you. So today's agenda, we're gonna go over RJG and cooling. Then uh, we're gonna go into R&D testing that I performed, get into implementation and validations, and then at the end conclude and have times for questions at the end. So RJG and cooling. RJG has been in the plastics industry for over 35 years. And we're headquartered in Traverse City, Michigan. RJG work with community college such as Rowan Cabarrus over in North Carolina, Southern Union State in Alabama, as well as Central Community College in Nebraska. And we're recognized as scientific molding educators and technology leaders in process monitoring and other entities around the world are located in Mexico, UK, France, Germany, as well as China. Every day, the quality of millions of plastic parts are processed using the molding principles that we teach and are verified by our data acquisition and process monitoring systems, ensuring that only good parts make it out the door and reject parts are contained. So let's get into cooling. What you need to know about cooling? Well, it expands as approximately 15% as it's heated into its molten state. So plastic cools as it shrinks, and if the shrinkage is left unchecked, molded parts may have quality defects, such as part dimensionals may be smaller than required, parts may be even contain sink marks and or internal voids, so the goal that we have of an injection mold is it should be designed to achieve equal as well as stable temperature throughout that part. And on average, 80% of the molding cycle is spent cooling the plastic part from the plastic's point of view. And roughly 40% of the BTUs from heating the plastic must, must then be removed before the part can be ejected, thus reaching the heat deflection temperature, or HDT. Heat is removed from the part in three different ways. First being conductive through the platens, as well as free convection into the air. And then last but not least is forced convection through its cooling lines of the mold. So this heat removal process involves two stages. The heat out of the plastic, which is slow. Why? Well, plastic is an insulator. And then heat out of the mold, which is much faster. So let's talk about cooling. Insulation or insulator plates. Insulation plates are critical for the mold if it's run above 120 degrees. We want to utilize this on both halves of the mold to ensure a thermal equilibrium has been reached. But why do we say 120 degrees? Well, anything above that temperature, you're now heating your platen, and now that's extreme waste of energy. So some cooling methods or media that we have out there. Water, which is usually utilized between 50 and 220 degrees if the water lines are rated that high. Pressurized water is another one, between 180 and 446 typical. Cartridge heaters, which are then utilized all the way up to about 600 degrees Fahrenheit. And then last but not least, we have oil, which uh, is usually up to about 660 degrees Fahrenheit. So some cooling products that we have out there on the market. Well, we have bubblers. 
A common flow rate that we see through a bubbler is about a tenth to a half gallon per minute. An advantage to them is they cannot be hooked up backwards, but a disadvantage is they easily clog. So we, we want to stress that you should filter as well as treat the cooling media that's going through that bubbler. And I also recommend that no more than four in series is used. Otherwise, we have baffles, which common flow rates between those, half gallon per minute, as well as up to 100 or up to 1.5 gallons per minute. If a baffler blade is too short, it causes a dead spot or hot spot. If they're too long, they're going to then restrict the flow. We also have to make note that they have to be perpendicular to the in and out. And again, I state that no more than four in series is recommended, and we'll get to that reason why later. So some other cooling uh, that we have in molds, we have gun drills or conventional machine cooling. And as we make note, we see that the mold, the insert there is not in a uniform color. Throughout there, it looks like it's uh, rainbow in color. So there's red spots, there's yellow, there's oranges, there's greens, there's blues. We wanna try to have like we have in the 3D printed cooling where it's much more uniform in color. If we have 3D printed or conformal cooled inserts, these offer flow rates that can vary based on whatever diameter that we can achieve inside that insert. Good thing, again, they cannot be hooked up backwards. But again, just like the bubbler, they can uh, easily clog. They offer much more uniform for that steel as well as part temperature. So obviously with cooling, that's uh, very important. As well as uh, if we're conformal cooling, that's a great choice for any time we have a tight tolerance part, whether that be for medical, pharma, automotive, consumer products, you name the industry, as long as you have a tight tolerance part, it's probably right for you. So some essentials when it comes to cooling uniformity, you start asking these questions. Do you have turbulent flow? Are your cooling lines sized properly? Are your cooling lines circuited properly? Well, if one of those is not checked, maybe we can start with solutions. Solution one, maybe to add or remove more water circuitry, right? Number two, if we add that solution, it'd be more higher conductivity inserts. Make sure that uh, we can draw more heat away from that plastic part faster. And solution three, would be the utilization of conformal cooling that we just saw. So any of these can improve the cooling uniformity. Now, when we start talking of cooling lines, we need to understand that there are three critical dimensions of cooling channels, the diameter, the depth, as well as pitch. To define the diameter, it's of the cooling channel in the cooling area, not the water line that's going to the mold. Also, the depth is the average distance from the center of the cooling channel to the surface of the part. And then finally, the pitch is the average distance between the cooling channels. We move over to the right side here. We look at the location of the water line placement being critical to achieve uniform part temperature. So as we see in the image depicted, depicted here, not as good the water lines do not uniformly cover the molded part area. And this would result in a localized hot spot that we would see around in this area here. So how do we know if the mold has enough cooling media transiting through the channels? Well, this is done by calculating the Reynolds number. Reynolds number is a critical to achieve the efficient heat transfer for your cooling media. So anything above 4,000, the cooling media exhibits eddy regions, which add turbulence and subsequently achieve efficient heat transfer. So cooling media like water has a kinematic viscosity, which means that it flows easier as the temperature rises. When we use glycol, typically a 50-50 blend with water, one must also make note that it will require up to three times higher flow rates to achieve turbulent flow 
i.e. above 4,000 for its Reynolds number. So we talked about the having no more than four in series for both the bubblers as well as the baffles. Now we're gonna start covering that. So when we start talking about circuiting of the mold, a moderate temperature rise across the mold from one circuit uh, in to out would be about three degrees or less. If we have a temperature rise of five degrees Fahrenheit or more, this is basically excessive circuiting. Or if we had more, more than four bubblers or baffles in series, typically we start seeing this to be greater than that five degree increase, which subsequently makes it that there's excessive circuiting. So running each and every circuit on its own source of coolant can also be overkill. So this must also require significantly higher amounts of GPMs or gallons per minute if we did it this way. And as we kind of see in this image depicted, this is worth noting that the amount of cycles until its steady state or a thermal equilibrium has been reached. So transient cooling analysis, which can be done through simulation, is assuming that perfect conditions exist. And this information can be used to improve your mold design as well as circuitry to achieve best possible mold cooling. So what is thermal conductivity? So thermal conductivity is defined as the quantity of heat just uh, transmitted due to the unit temperature gradient in unit time under steady conditions in a direction normal to the surface of the unit eight area. What does that mean? Well, that means it has how much thermal conductivity is, how much heat can be dissipated out of that, we'll, we'll call it uh, media or, or steel or aluminum, and how quickly it can be done. So the higher the number, the better it is at dissipating heat. And for example, many molders may build and use an aluminum mold for a prototype. The products coming off of that mold meet quality standard, and so they build another mold with, say, P20 or H13. Now the parts coming off the mold will not meet the same quality standard. The cooling time will then increase if the process engineer conducted a cooling time or part ejection readiness study. This is due to the thermal conductivity of that mold material substrate. So surface coatings that we can have create barrier layers that can have an impact on the mold material substrate. No matter what the mold coating company informs you, by adding a mold surface coating, you can impact the part in the mold's ability to dissipate heat, thus changing the thermal conductivity. This is like a candy chocolate, right? Once uh, it's covered in a shell, like an M&M, it has a barrier layer preventing the chocolate candy from melting. So we see here as a water channel, water channel scale formation. And this reduces the heat transfer rate and increases the water pressure drop through the heat exchanger and pipes. As Berger and Brown Engineering say, 20 thousandths of calcium is equivalent to two inches of steel. And the fact that in one study shown two thousandths of fouling or calcium depositing will increase pumping needs by up to 20%. So efficient and consistent heat transfer in molds is essential for the part process. Increased cycle times as well as decreased part quality can result. It is highly recommend to include mold cooling circuitry cleaning in every preventative maintenance schedule. Now let's get into some R&D testing that I performed. So we talk about connections. We have the diameter of the fitting that must be the same size as the drilled hole uh, into the mold to maximize the flow, as well as recessed so they minimize damage when loading and unloading of the mold. Well, all the fittings that I tested here, and this was the testing setup, were of the 300 series uh, quarter, I'm sorry, 16th inch, 8th inch, as well as 3 8th inch thread. 
And then I also tested the uh, shut off nipple and mating uh, coupling or safety couplings. So in this water fitting testing, we see that in the 3 8 thread, it has an ID of 346 thousandths of an inch. This resulted in 2.5 gallons per minute at 30 PSI. And keep note that all of these were tested at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And in doing so, eighth inch thread has a 0.236 or 236 thousandths of an inch ID. And this also resulted in the same two and a half gallons per minute at 30 PSI. Moving forward, the 16th inch thread has only 193 thousandths of an inch ID, and this resulted in two gallons per minute and 40 PSI. So we've now lost a half gallon per minute and gained 10 PSI, which means it makes sense. We've restricted the flow. Three eighths thread when it comes to the safety fitting. Now we have the flow or the full travel of that ID being 170 thousandths there. And we're only capable of reaching a half a gallon per minute at 50 PSI. So here's the results of that testing. And take note which, which has reached the Reynolds number of 4,000 or greater. The safety fittings were also tested at 75 degrees Fahrenheit as well as 200 degrees Fahrenheit to visualize the spectrum of impact that this type of fitting has on mold cooling efficiency. So in conclusion here in the water fitting testing, using stemmed or valved safety fittings is not recommended as you will most likely not reach a Reynolds number of greater than 4,000, which then would then ensure the adequate heat transfer can take place. So the utilization of open nipples and couplings in combination with a blowback valve uh, with pneumatics is more preferred and more and just as safe. So for those of you that like math, here's an example of a cooling time calculator. So if we have a given ABS part with a thickness of 118 thousandths, my mold temperature being 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and melt temperature being 420 degrees Fahrenheit. I was curious if uh, the math truly does work out. And the cooling estimated time here is 20.61 seconds. So let's check it out. And knowing that this particular material utilized has a 180 degree HDT. So I tested that uh, theory out. And at 17 seconds of cooling time, I was about 192 degrees upon ejection and cooling time uh, of 20.4 seconds, I did reach around that 180 uh, one degrees Fahrenheit mark. So that was good. So ABS has a HTT of 180 degrees. The part quality should always be checked to verify parts meet acceptance criteria. Even if you have reached the HDT or not, we should always check those. And then when I tested all of this, I wanted to see if clamp tonnage had an effect. And during this trial, it did not have effect on time to reach HDT. And then another thing to note was ejector size was more impactful for pin push than ejector speed was. So other things to note. So let's talk about warp. Well. This part that we're seeing here was manufactured with that molding cycle time uh, that we were talking about with the 17 second cooling time uh, to be exact. So it was above HDT and the part had not reached that HDT. So subsequently the part begins to warp post molding. And as we can see, uh, it's warping uh, right in front of you on the video on the far left. I'm spinning it around in the center. And then at the end, after it's fully been cooled to room temperature, I show you a good versus bad part uh, scenario. So some measurement instruments uh, that I utilized during testing and was, was curious if uh, one's better than another out in the industry. Well, I utilized surface probe, which can be used for all mold material substrates as well as parts. And the downside is that force uh, at which you apply can possibly impact your reading. 
uh, magnetic thermocouple, which can be used for only ferrous metal mold material substrates. And the magnet on this keeps a consistent pull force so that all readings are done at the same condition, which is good. Uh, thermal imaging camera that was utilized can be used on all mold material substrates as well as parts. But the downside is anytime that we have a highly polished mold that reflects and can skew the readings, and the same goes for infrared uh, temperature guns. It can be also used on all mold material substrates as well as parts. And we see that same as thermal imaging camera. If it's highly polished, we're gonna now skew our results uh, because of its being highly polished. And as you can see here, there really isn't much difference between the readings of each of these instrument types. So my recommendation is to select one and continue to use it. Now let's move forward with implementation and validations. So if we're looking at injection molded parts and what kind of defects we might see, so, so come out, common defects in injection molding, as we see the majority of these defects can be impacted by the mold or part cooling, whether it's dimensional variation, warpage, sink, voids, those are all cooling issues. So here's a common problem. If you're in the industry and you're at the first molding trial, i.e. the T0 trial, and there's a hot spot and the parts are just not capable of meeting dimensional requirements for assembly now. And just think, if you used simulation that, use, that utilizes accurate waterline placement for hot spots so they could be identified, and the end warps inward significantly, we can now see that if we would have used simulation, we could have avoided all of this if simulation was used. And in this case, no one was able to identify the problem in time, so costly mold modifications were uh, required for this. So here's a product life cycle for a plastic injection molded part. If the part gets designed, it then goes through a design for manufacturing review, your development team or RJG's T0 team can then be uh, tagged in to help. The mold design is then made and hopefully mold filling simulations are performed. The mold is then built and ready for trial, typically at a tryout site. Hopefully the results of this T0 molding trial were recorded, but sometimes they're not. Next, the mold goes to the production site to trial and hopefully the process engineer has all the prior trial report information and the mold filling simulation report to go off, but this isn't always the case. And the engineer is then stuck trying to reinvent the wheel. So I can't stress enough, documentation and communication are absolutely key to a successful product launch. So which brings us to IQ OQPQ which is used in the medical and pharma industries. Uh, to the automotive for folks here, this uh, is equivalent to the PPAP or part, uh, product part approval process, which includes uh, APQP or advanced product quality planning. And this, we have the product requirement specifications uh, or PRSs for the single use medical parts that typically have critical to function tight tolerances, like as you see in the bottom right and the usage of good part and mold design practices and tools like simulation can help us predict what will happen prior to the mold built. During this validation protocol stages of IQ, OQ, PQ, special attention to detail must be placed on achieving all product acceptance criteria, which includes like running high nominal low processes to give insight as to where the accepted part process window is, uh, running first article inspection and relevant product testing is also crucial. And finally, having AQ and AQL inspection criteria. And all this is done within the ISO 1345 QMS that, structure, that stresses risk management. So during the validation phase, the main focus is on process quality and volume capabilities. So typical tools that we see are statistical process control or SPC, measurement systems analysis or MSA, and process capability studies or PCS. 
And so under statistical process control, process capability or CP is a statistical measurement of a process's ability to produce parts within specified limits on a consistent basis. And process capability indices of CP and CPK evaluate the output of a process in comparison to the specification limits determined by the target value and tolerance range. CP tells you if your process is capable of making parts within specifications, and CPK tells you if your process is centered between the specification limits. If we check out this illustration in the third one of the CP, which is capable, but the CPK is low or not centered, the car will end up hitting the garage. And I like to help others look at this in a different way. CP, as, as the way we may be looking at it from a marksman, would be equivalent to how tight our groupings are. CPK, on the other hand, from that viewpoint, would be how close to the bullseye we actually are. So measurement systems analysis is looking at the, at the all perspectives of the mold measurement or part measurement. For instance, making sure that you have collaborated, collaborated measurement uh, instruments that consist, consistently and precisely measure parts. I mentioned the utilization of mold filling simulations. Injection molding involves multiple domains, and even though the analysis may have been done well, there are many variables or factors that can cause inconsistencies in the outcome of reality. And for example, if the mold is launched in the wrong machine or an incapable machine, it may not perform as it was expected in simulation. Domains are dependent upon each other. And one single change in one domain can impact one or more of the others. And this ultimately impacts the relationship from prediction to real world. And so there are two types of variables that we see and can be documented for a given part process. The first here is MSV or machine specific variables. And this defines a specific molding process for a specific machine. The industry often refers to this as a machine setup sheet or a standard condition sheet. The second type of variable that can be documented for given part process is called MIV or machine independent variables. This defines a specific molding process from a plastics point of view. This process can then be transferred to other pre-qualified or capable machines within a short period of time. Mold temperature mapping uh, using the temperature measuring instruments that we talked about earlier is very much encouraged during this stage. With the mold temperature mapping completed, and later if the mold started making parts that no longer meet print specification, you can then verify if the mold temperature is playing a role in this issue. For ultimate MIV monitoring, mold sensors are viewed to be the most robust method to produce parts repeatedly, despite of time, machines, and or environment. What is the purpose of using mold sensors? Well, one of those is, is to assure part quality is repeatable. As an example, a part can be processed in machine A repeatedly with good quality. At a later time, the mold is then transferred to machine B. In order to produce the same quality parts, the exact process needs to be implemented in machine B. And as you shall agree, the several variables into the molding process, and in the end, the part process, which happens inside the cavity, determines part quality. And the part process, such as pressure and temperature, can be measured by a variety of mold sensors. And with temperature sensors installed and trended, this is equivalent to the mold temperature mapping that we talked about earlier. With the use of simulation, many companies use the results to predict things like cooling, which in turn results in shrinkage. If our expectation is to overcome all challenging issues and predict a hole in one every time, we're likely to find this to be extremely difficult, aren't we? Well, how about predicting 
the process as an on the green in one and predicting the mold, molding process parameters. And just like a golfer, if our goal is to continue to improve and focus on getting as close as possible, the more collaborative work completed together, the closer we can get. So when we're looking at designing a part and running a simulation, we have to understand that there's part requirements, whether it's appearance, dimensionals, tolerance, performance and durability, uh, material evaluations comes into part design for manufacturing we then get into tooling considerations where there's gating scenarios there's flow patterns pressure loss cycle times you name it all over the board the part designer then designs the part for the application the part design cad file is then evaluated by your uh product development team and then then hopefully you're running a simulation and in medical industries we see that this part uh, as part of the design qualification process, which concentrates on the user requirement specifications and product requirement specifications. And the graphic on the top left here shows the thickness distribution of the part. And if you watch the filling animation here, you can see that the hesitation is near the thin areas as depicted in the thickness distribution graphic. And the thickest areas will take the most amount of time to cool and these areas will become hot spots and can lead to sinks or voids in the end product. So furthermore, in optimization, we have mold design via simulation. It's critical to understand the medical or the mold metal selection as well as functions of the mold. The mold has to form the cavities, it has to fill and pack the part, has to vent all of the uh, entrapped air, as well as cool the part, and then eject that part. So the mold's integrity, as well as the machine capabilities are uh, very much impactful to the mold selection and the material selection, as we have adequate support pillars, uh, which then can withstand the deflection caused by cavity pressure. And as we see on the image on the bottom right, so machine compatibility, meaning that the mold will fit in the machine and the machine is capable of producing parts meeting quality specifications. When it comes to process, there's understandings from optimal injection speeds, hopefully from a volumetric standpoint. We have gate seal, which is a part of cooling as well. Part ejection readiness, thus reaching the HDT, again, cooling. Optimized part process, including good part quality, uh, minimizing warpage, shortest cycle time possible, reasonable machine requirements, as well as the adequate mold shrinkage. Part and mold designs are simulated to determine if the part can be made correctly and efficiency. Or efficiently, I'm sorry. And once complete, we can export the predicted MIV, machine independent variables, or universal process to then import into the RJG product called the hub. Trialing in a virtual DOE space helps us offer insight as to where the process specification limits can be temporarily set. Verification of these conditions is highly beneficial to correlate once the mold is ready. Again, simulation is focusing on, simu on cooling efficiency. And as we see here, maybe it's best that we have our cooling time set or cycle time set uh, so that we can have five more seconds of cooling time uh, being utilized. Once this information is populated, the simulation into our asset database within the hub, also known as the mold transfer application, we can then automatically list and identify the machines capable of running that mold before the tool is even cut. Once we choose the capable machine, the application will automatically produce a forecasted machine setup based on the machine independent variables simulated in cyberspace. And the key point here is launching the tool in cyberspace. Active involvement in early engineering steps can help prevent complications in production. 
And now here the mold, the mold builder builds the mold based on the agreed mold design. And then when complete, the mold can now be trialed uh, on site or shipped to the customer. So here now we see the forecasted setup sheet, which is created and downloaded and then can be printed from the hub. And this uh, is used as a starting point for process development. But this is us getting on the green and one. Once a process is adjusted and good parts are produced and approved by quality department, the part data will then be recorded and final process will be captured in the hub. The process engineer receives quality department approval and saves the validated machine specific variables on the hub and then converts to a corresponding MIV or machine independent variables for future mold transfers. The final MIV and MSV can then be viewed in the hub and we can now just uh, compare the discrepancies for the forecasted and predicted setups for real validated setups. And the uh, graphic on the bottom shows the Copilot, which is another RJG uh, product, and in cavity pressure sensors for this product offering and available by RJG. And located in the graphic area is shown the locations of the actual post gate and end of cavity pressure sensors. And lots of valuable information can be found within simulation, uh, even if the mold is not instrumented, like fill time, pack time, cooling time, uh, melt front locations, pressure, part temperature, you name it, lots of them. So meanwhile, the engineer can then correlate the part data to the process data on the hub. Using the comparison, we can establish, establish process windows and set alarms using the co-pilot during production. Any variation outside upper and lower alarm limits is observed, then we see suspect parts can be automatically contained. And this is a high level overview of a proven interface with molding machines, which we instrument molds, auxiliaries, and simulation support is utilized. This is an ideal platform for one source of data management. So let's look at this mold that we've been looking at for a while, the RGG design pod, and compare and review the few of the process variables predicted versus validated. After the clamp tonnage study, was, it was determined that 50 tons of clamp force was required, which is a difference in five tons. Time to reach HDT was nine seconds, as found by a thermal imaging camera, is a difference of one second. And the final uh, actual fill, was 0.35 seconds, which was a difference of 0 0.07 seconds, and hold time was then determined to be nine seconds uh, using the gate seal study, and a difference in one second. So overall, the process that was predicted was very comparable to the validated process. So correlation activities from a thermal image, or from, yeah, from a thermal imaging camera here, uh, it's important to perform correlation activities for anything cooling related. On the left, you can see the simulation prediction uh, for hot spots after ejection. And on the right is a thermal imaging camera capture of the molded part from the validated setup. Keep in mind that the validated process was two seconds less than prediction. So the correlation in this case, that the simulated temperature of the hot spot would be around 200 while the thermal imaging camera shows the temperature of 220. And these images depict the simulation to actual result for sync mark. And as you can see, the part results in sync mark as predicted in that same location. Simulation predicts uh, 60.393 millimeters and the actual result was 60.320 which was a difference in point, point 0.073 millimeters or three thousandths of an inch. And again, this could be impacted by the cycle time being two seconds faster, which allowed more post mold shrinkage to occur. So to conclude, today we discussed the importance of cooling efficiency and gave valuable information how to, on how to achieve it. Cooling accounts for most of the injection molding cycle time, 80% uh, to be exact from a
plastics point of view, and you can improve quality, reduce cycle times, as well as lower costs by perfecting the process of cooling. And we also reviewed and evaluated various cooling media products and measuring tools to ensure proper cooling is achieved. That's all I have for today. I thank you very much for your time and attendance. All right, thank you, Corey. Uh, we do have a couple questions from the audience. Um, so, Corey, what is something that you would recommend for molders to start doing you know, right now? I would say the usage of a bore scope, and as you saw that one video depicting going into the cooling channels, uh, I would use a bore scope to determine the current state of your cooling channels. Make sure that there's no calcium depositing. All right, and on the flip side, what is something that you would recommend for molders to stop doing? Uh, I would immediately stop using valve safety fittings. Okay. And does RJG offer services to molders anytime during the product launch cycle? Absolutely, yes. RJG T0, which I'm a part of, uh, can help molders, whether that be in an early stage of the part design. We've also helped customers that cannot make quality parts for nearly three years being successful. So, and anywhere in between that. All right. Well, uh, there's one more question. How would you recommend removing the calcium deposits from cooling lines? I, I would use uh, different products that are on the market for descaling or, or decalcium uh, uh, removing of that. So there's many products out there on the market. Uh, I, I can't say as a consultant, uh, one's better than another. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions come through. So, Corey, I want to thank you again, as well as the rest of our JG for offering all of the information today. Uh, just a reminder to the attendees, the recording will be posted by the end of the week. Thank you to everyone for being here. And I will now end the webinar. Everyone have a great day.